everyone, and welcome to episode nine of FBI Retired Case File Review with Jerry Williams. I'm a retired agent writing crime fiction inspired by actual FBI cases. In this episode, I get to interview retired supervisory special agent John Whiteside, who served 30 years with the FBI. John talks about his investigation of the longest open espionage case ever brought before the U.S. courts. 32 years after former NSA employee Robert Lipka stole and sold military secrets to the KGB, John was able to gather the evidence that finally exposed the betrayal. For his outstanding work on this espionage case, John received from the then director of the CIA, George Tenet, the National Intelligence Certificate of Distinction. Also during this interview, John talks about his assignment to a small satellite office in rural Mississippi in the 1970s. After listening to this interview, if you want to learn even more about John, he has authored two books, Fool's Mate and Cypress Shade, both which are available at Amazon.com. Links to the Facebook pages for both books are posted at jerrywilliams.com. Before we begin the interview, I want to remind everyone enjoying the podcast that it will be my birthday next week on March 25th. And a great birthday gift to me would be for you to go to iTunes to review and rate FBI Retired Case File Review. And if you go to my website, I certainly would also appreciate it if you signed up for my quarterly crime fiction newsletter. I'll be sending out a newsletter to my email subscribers in mid-April. Please stick around after the interview. I just read the most amazing book full of surprises and twists that I want to talk to you about. All right, here's the interview. I am excited to introduce everyone to my guest for today, and it is John Whiteside. Hi, John. Hi, Jerry. How are you? I'm doing great. I'm really excited to talk with you because I know all about one of your most famous cases, and I think the listeners are going to be very excited to hear about it. But before we get into that, I want to learn a little bit about you. When did you join the FBI? I joined the FBI in April of 1971. When did you retire? I retired in February of 2001, so I spent almost uh, 30 years. Now, you're talking about retiring in 2001. Was that before 9-11 or after 9-11? It was in February before 9-11. I had an offer with a private investigation company, so I decided uh, I only had three years remaining until the age of 57, so I thought it would be best to take the offer for the private investigation company. Oh, that that makes sense. Um, I was just wondering, you know, when 9-11 happened, Did you have that feeling like, oh my, you know, I wish I was there, I wish I was still with the FBI working on uh, those investigations, because everybody in the FBI was put on those investigations, um, you know, right after 9-11? Yeah, I I was really upset that I had left and had briefly considered trying to go back, but apparently, and there was some talk about them hiring recently retired agents to come back and work 9-11. However, the situation that I was in with this company, I didn't want to, you know, deny them my presence. And uh, but I did regret leaving. I wish I had been there. Yeah, I could understand that. All right. So you joined in 1971. Mm -hmm. Where are you from? I actually was born and raised in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and uh, attended Temple University in Philadelphia. After college, I actually majored in physical education. And in 1969, had my first uh, job teaching elementary school physical education to kindergarten through sixth grade children. And is that what you were doing just before you joined the FBI? Yes, after a month. I had actually been a summer police officer in Stone Harbor, New Jersey for three summers. Seashore towns hire uh, additional police officers to augment the, the size of the summer population. And I had worked in Stone Harbor from 1968 to 1970. And once I started teaching, I kind of knew after the first month or so that uh, physical education teaching wasn't going to be my career. I wanted to get into law enforcement. Okay. And so did you go back and do that full time as a police officer? No, I, I continued to teach and I sent out resumes 
to different police departments. I took the Philadelphia Police Department exam. Uh, I checked with some state police departments. They all had residency requirements, however. And uh, I applied to the Bureau in October of 1970. They told me to just write a letter if I was interested that they weren't hiring. And if anything changed, they would get back to me. A year later, in October of 1970, I actually got a call from the FBI in Philadelphia asking if I was still interested in being in the FBI. And I immediately said yes. And uh, by April, I'd started training school. Well, I'm sure that was exciting for you to, you know, to have an interest to go into law enforcement full time and you go directly into the FBI. It was great. It was a dream come true. In fact, I had taken some courses at night at Temple University, some police science courses uh, with a bunch of Philadelphia police officers. I was the only non-police officer there. They were taking courses to take sergeants exams and lieutenants exams. And it was actually that those courses that helped me pass, I think, the FBI legal test. I was very fortunate. All right. So you're at the academy and you find out what your first office of assignment is going to be. Where were you assigned? I was assigned to Cleveland, Ohio. I went out to Cleveland in uh, July of 1971. I was only there 10 weeks and I was transferred to the Akron, Ohio resident agency. I was single at the time and I think it was just a more inexpensive transfer uh, to move a, a single guy to the RA. So I spent about another, uh, almost another year there uh, before my second office transfer. I also got married while I was in Ohio to uh, a lady who was employed by the FBI. Oh, one of those Bew marriages. Uh. <laughs> in fact, that's why I thought they transferred me to Akron, but I don't think that was the real, the real reason. <laughs> oh, to stop the romance? <laughs> well, they, you know, they didn't perhaps approve of the romance, but uh, I continued uh, okay. to drive up to uh, Ohio, to Cleveland, the Cleveland area to meet my wife, and we actually got married and transferred at the same time. All right, so from uh, Ohio to... From Ohio, we were tra- I got transfer orders to Jackson, Mississippi. However, and just as I was preparing myself for the distant transfer, the orders were rescinded and I was transferred to Greenville, Mississippi, resident agency, which is in the heart of the Mississippi Delta on the Mississippi River. So that was a kind of a shock, although my wife uh, said, you know, you've already been in one resident agency, you should probably enjoy this. So she was positive about the transfer. Could you explain to the listeners what a resident agency is? A resident agency is just a small satellite office out of the large field office. It allows for the FBI to have more rapid response time to different crimes that might occur in in areas outside of the field office. Usually there's seven, eight, or nine resident agencies attached to every field office, and they can vary in size from from one agent to uh, 30 or 40 agents. And how many were in the, did you say Greenville? Yeah, Greenville, Mississippi. We had uh, a total of seven during my stay there, which was a large number. Uh, Greenville ultimately dwindled down uh, to uh, small, to four, and then to two, and it's actually now closed uh, based on some different priorities that Bureau has. So what was happening in Greenville, Mississippi in the early 1970s that warranted for them to have seven or eight people in that resident agency? Well, the biggest problem is I only see the the fallout from the civil rights issues in the mid-60s and late 60s. Mississippi was probably the most notorious for all the civil rights problems, the voter registration problems for blacks and uh, and for the Ku Klux Klan. Fortunately for Greenville, Greenville had always been a more liberal community, and they didn't have as much Klan membership by the time I got there as a lot of other towns in Mississippi. However, we still had a lot of discrimination issues, and we had a lot of uh, general criminal type things that went on as well. In fact, our resident agency had the notorious Mississippi State Penitentiary at Parchman, Mississippi, uh, as one of the places that we had to deal with. And there were just hundreds of civil rights cases there, hundreds of inmates involved in different kinds of scams, and it, uh, it really kept us quite busy. So was there a particular violation that you worked I work mostly just general criminal cases and uh, civil rights cases. I did have a a bureau special at the Mississippi State Penitentiary where inmates were, uh, because their mail had been censored originally, there was a big lawsuit and they, uh, the judge ruled that the mail couldn't be checked. Their personal mail should be personal. And as a result of that, the inmates started this con where they were ordering 
items from mail order houses were using these blank counter checks that they could get from any financial institution. And on visiting Sundays, they would get all this merchandise and would sell it. And it was in the thousands of dollars at one point. So ultimately, we had to a big bureau special trying to identify the inmates that were writing the bad checks, buying all the merchandise, which ultimately led to a, a new hearing in federal court where they reestablished some of the, uh, took away some of the mail privileges that they had granted to the inmates. It's amazing to think that uh, here you have uh, incarcerated individuals still, you know, pulling scams, still, uh, you know, violating the law. It was unbelievable. I mean, they would—they were guys that would do uh, forgeries of one-dollar money orders and make them into uh, the amount of one hundred ninety-one dollars, and they would send them out to uh, girlfriends in these lonely hearts clubs, magazines, and uh, the girls would send one-dollar money orders in, in cans of talcum powder. The inmates would open the talcum powder, dump the powder out, get the money orders, and they'd alter them, and then they mail them back to their girlfriends for cashing. And there was always some scam going on. It was just really unbelievable. But the okay. worst part of the penitentiary was the fact when I first got there, uh, I would drive up to a gate. Uh, it was If you've ever seen the movie Cool Hand Luke, the prison in that yes. was very similar to Parchment, except Parchment, I think, was worse. Uh, I would drive up to the gate the first time I went, and I left my gun with a guard at the outside of the gate. I would pick my gun up when I left. It wasn't until I left and had a partner with me who said, do you know who you just left your gun with? And I said, yeah, the gate guard. He says, well, yeah, but he was a trusty inmate. I mean, it was just unbelievable, some of the uh, things that were going on at the time. And again, fortunately, that was all changed uh, while I was there after a number of lawsuits and, and court decisions. But it was quite a quite an assignment down there. And I wrote my wow. second book, actually. Uh, my second book is called Cypress Shade about my experiences uh, in Mississippi. All right. Well, I will put a link to that. Uh, it's a memoir, right? Yes, it's a memoir. I'll put a link to uh, that book and so they can, uh, the listeners can learn a little bit more about your experiences down in Greenville, Mississippi. And I'll have that on uh, jerrywilliams.com so they can go right to it. I take it also you have your, you have your own website? I just use uh, Facebook uh, Facebook pages for my books, Jerry. You know, it's Facebook at the Fool's Mate book or Facebook at Cypress Shade. I'll put a link to, to that, too. Okay. All right, so how long were you in Greenville, Mississippi? I was in Greenville for three years, and we had a child uh, once we got down there. And the school situation was so dismal, uh, and the area was just getting worse year by year in terms of people leaving and crime increasing. Uh, I had one option, and being from Philadelphia and my wife being from Cleveland, we had the opportunity to put in for a transfer to New York. And after much soul-searching, we decided to go to New York. Again, I had contacts. My parents had a house in New Jersey on the beach. Uh, we would be closer to that. So we put in for the transfer and got it. So I went to New York in 1975 and stayed there for five years. Okay. And what did you work there? I worked as, for the first time I started the work. Russian or Soviet counterintelligence cases, and I did work for two years in organized crime. But I found that I didn't like to do wiretaps in organized crime, so I went back to the Russian Soviet counterintelligence work and stayed in that work for the rest of my career. And that uh, definitely is your area of expertise. Now, for the five years in New York, then you went to, did you say headquarters? Yes, I was transferred to headquarters as a supervisor in the KGB unit. I stayed there for three years, and that was kind of a time when I decided, had to decide whether I wanted to move up administratively in the FBI or just go back to being a street agent. And that's what I really like to do, be a street agent. I found out that I was uh, number one for the transfer to Philadelphia, so I left headquarters in the Administrative Advancement Program and went back to uh, my hometown of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. In did you actually work in did you actually work in headquarters city in Philadelphia or did you go out to one of the RAs Newtown Square immediately? I was in Philadelphia for three years until 1986 and then I was transferred to the Newtown Square office Newtown Square resident agency where I stayed for 11 years and then I completed my career with about four years in Philadelphia uh, as a supervisor of the counterintelligence squad. Nowadays, when we talk about uh, you know dealing with overseas, we talk a lot more about terrorism. And I think that um, espionage, people don't think that happens 
uh, as much as it did anymore. And I don't even know if the Bureau puts us the same amount of energy in espionage cases. But definitely during your time period, um, right after the Cold War, where secrets were coming out and people were talking more, we were able to find out more about things that had been taken or stolen from, from uh, the United States. Yeah, that's correct. In fact, you know, in 1985, I remember distinctly, we used to call that the year of the spy because there were so many major spy arrests conducted in that year. And at that time, 22%, if I'm, and I believe I'm correct in this, 22% of the FBI agents in the country worked foreign counterintelligence cases and espionage cases. By 1995, after the Soviet Union had collapsed in, in 1989, 1990, by 1995, only 11% of FBI agents worked both counterintelligence cases and terrorism cases. So I, I tell you that it, there's no big surprise to me to find out, you know, be surprised when 2000, uh, 9-11 happened in 2001. We had just dropped the effort and moved to, to other places thinking that the, that the threat was gone, the threat from the Soviet Union was gone, and it never ended. You know, the KGB never went away. It's as viable and as active today as it ever was. So when you saw the decrease uh, effort, I mean, how did you feel about that? Well, I was appalled. I mean, I, I was a lone voice crying for more people to work this. Uh, you know, I think in part the FBI has helped a lot of police departments, a lot of sheriff's offices, a lot of law enforcement agencies become much better and much more competent in what they do. And I, I always thought that the FBI would be better off giving up some of its general criminal work to the police departments and concentrating more on counterintelligence cases and the terrorism cases. I knew what the threat was. I know it's not as exciting as working bank robberies and fugitives, but, you know, the threat was there. And I guess we're victims of what Congress will pay for, too. So there wasn't much anyone could do about it. And it took the tragedy of 9-11 to, I think at this point, I think at least 50 percent of the FBI's efforts in counterterrorism and, and counterintelligence. So, uh, unfortunately, you were correct. <laughs> unfortunately, I was somewhat vindicated. Yeah, that's, that's true. All right, so you said that 1985 was kind of known as the year of the spy. Why? Well, there were some major spy arrests. John Walker, who was in the Navy, uh, was arrested that year. Ronald Pelton, who was an NSA employee, an NSA spy, was arrested that year. Jonathan Pollard, who spied for Israel, was arrested that year. And these were major significant cases. And I think that at the same time, there was a spy in Germany by the name of Clyde Lee Conrad. And the point is, if Conrad, who was spying on NATO, and Walker, who was spying for the Navy, in the Navy, had ever, you know, if the Soviets really cared, they would have just had an incredible advantage had we ever gone to war at that period of time in our, in our history. So that's why those major cases came up. Uh, at that time, I didn't know anything about my spy case, although it had been going on since 1965. Your spy case. So why don't we get into that and um, tell me when you first learned that there may be someone who had been involved in espionage living uh, and working in, uh, near the Philadelphia area? Well, in August of 1992, uh, there was a KGB former KGB officer who had retired, who was not happy with the Soviet Union, the former Soviet Union. And for many years, he was collecting information from KGB archives about uh, spy cases. And he had put together this huge document. He smuggled the document out of, of Russia and was recruited by the British Intelligence Service. Uh, his name was Vasily Matrokin. He's also written about four books about his efforts but Matrokin came to the FBI in August of 1992 and told us that a fellow by the name of Robert Stephen Lipka, who uh, was in the U.S. Army assigned to the National Security Agency in 1963, began, and began conducting selling secrets in September of 1965 to the KGB in, in Washington, D.C., uh, from NSA, and continued to do so until August of 1967, when he left, uh, left the Army because his uh, enlistment period had ended. Now, did he give you his true name, or did he give you a code name or nickname for Robert Lipka? 
He he gave us his KGB code name, which was Dan, D-A-N. He gave us, look, his true name, date of birth. He gave us his wife's name. He told us that he was leaving the Army to go to college at Norrisville, Pennsylvania. And uh, he told us that his wife was a nurse, a nursing assistant at St. Joseph's Hospital in Lancaster. So he gave us some pretty good information. But more importantly, he told us that he made a clandestine dead drop containing NSA top secret information every two weeks from September of 1965 until August of 1967, uh, was paid $27,000 for his efforts. And uh, it was fairly significant that all the information was over 200 top secret documents were passed. And this, uh, the top secret documents, what kind of damage, what kind of information was in there that could do damage to uh, the United States? Unfortunately, Matroka never saw the documents. He had copied some information from a KGB file. Uh, he didn't know that, and NSA tried very hard during our investigation to identify those documents. The only insight that we have into those the documents that he passed was from a book written by a former KGB general by the name of Oleg Kalugin. He wrote a book called The First Directorate, and in that book, on one page, he talks about Lipka, not by name, but by uh, his military affiliation at NSA, and says that Lipka passed the presidential daily and weekly briefs. He passed uh, troop movements, uh, information on troop movements about our soldiers in Vietnam during the Vietnam War, and uh, State Department information, NATO information, things like that. Later on, at the end of the investigation, Lipka actually wrote, uh, to the prosecutor and told her that, that even though some soldiers had died as a result of the information he provided, uh, we, should, we should be more concerned about the, the status of his children presently. So we do know that whatever he passed did take the lives of an unknown number of soldiers in Vietnam. And so that was something he admitted that we might not have known about if he hadn't have said that? Yeah, that's exactly right. I mean, we, we had the insight that he had passed the uh, troop movement information but we didn't know that soldiers had been killed. And he, he basically must have passed something he knew about, that uh, some soldiers were killed as a result of his information. But, again, he qualified that saying, but think about my children. That was long ago in the 60s. Think about my children in the 90s you know, as a way to try to get, you know, paroled or let on, you know, not charged with them, put in prison. And I guess also an indication of the significance of the documents was the fact that in the 60s they were paying $27,000. I mean, back then that uh, uh, was a significant amount of money. Right. Well, he made he was paid $500 every two weeks or $1,000 a month, and that was five times his monthly salary. And I tell people, all you have to do you know, to compare is multiply your monthly salaries times five today, and you'll see some... You'll have some idea of how much how much money he was actually paid in 1965 dollars, and it was a significant amount of money. There's also some evidence uh, from a different source that back in the in the 1970s that he was paid a KGB agent by the name of Dan was paid 150 thousand dollars for his efforts. Wow! So it's very possible that once he left, we do know that he took documents with him. Uh, that once he left, he may have continued to make money. Um, or he may have conned the KGB with the uh, dangling a carrot that he would, after graduating from college, he might go back to NSA and would be of value to them. So they may have paid for that information. So he was a very, you know, here's a guy that was a spy for NSA, for the KGB, who went undetected. They would have loved to have him come back after his college degree. Now, first of all, I think we probably should step back for a moment and give... Uh, the listeners an understanding of the difference between working espionage as an FBI agent and as a CIA officer, because that sometimes gets confusing for for you know for for people. Mm -hmm. Well, the CIA uh, CIA case officers are their job is to collect intelligence overseas from foreign countries, political information, economic information, uh, military information information on things like coal production and, and you know, whatever um, is going on in any particular country. That's their job in the CIA. The FBI has a counterintelligence function. We are to, to identi identify, uh, penetrate, and neutralize the uh, activities of a CIA-type person 
who was in this country as a foreign intelligence officer, like a, a Russian KGB officer or a Chinese intelligence officer or even, a, you know, an intelligence officer from many, even a friendly country from France, perhaps. Our job is to defeat their efforts at trying to collect United States secrets. The CIA officers overseas collect foreign intelligence, foreign government secrets for our benefit, for the benefit of the uh, the war fighters and the uh, you know the president, so he can st- stay above uh, on top of uh, the world situation. So when you're talking about, just to make it very, very simple and plain, when you're talking about somebody hunting down spies, that's the FBI, not the CIA. Well, that's correct. The CIA are spies and uh, overseas for us. They're our spies. Uh, when, you know, it's the FBI who hunts down the spies. All right. So that leads us right into Robert Lipka. So you have this information. I mean, uh, based on this information, you just can't go out and uh, knock on Lipka's door and arrest him. You now have to develop some type of investigation to gather this evidence. So tell us about that. So you're a real spy hunter. So tell us how you hunted down this spy. Well, the first thing we tried to do was verify that that the information from Matrokin even had any value, that it was true, that it wasn't some witch hunt that he was uh, sending us on. Uh, I went out to Lancaster County. I verified uh, his attendance at a, a school in uh, Cumberland County out in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. Got his background there. We went down to NSA, reviewed his records, and everything that Matrokin told us about him was fit. Um, we pulled his files. Uh, the dates were all accurate. His wife's name was accurate. Everything that was prevented, uh, presented to us by Matrokin was spot on. So we, we got together with our uh, some of the NSA people that I worked with from the counterintelligence group and another uh, co-case agent, Dan Brennan, from the FBI from Baltimore office. And uh, we worked together. We came up with a plan. Uh, we wanted to conduct what we call a false flag investigation against Robert Lipka. That's kind of when you use an undercover FBI agent posing as a Russian. And in this particular case, we had uh, the undercover FBI agent pose as a Russian military intelligence officer. And the plan was to get Lipka to talk about what he had done in the past. It wasn't done to make him commit a new crime. We just wanted him to discuss his past spying activity. And what we did was we told The plan was to tell Lipka that the military intelligence service, the GRU, uh, was taking over after the fall of the Soviet Union, taking over for the KGB and reaching out to former KGB agents and seeing if they'd be willing to come back into the fold and help because he was so successful. So that was the plan. And we initiated that undercover operation in May of 1993, hoping that Lipka would respond. Uh, We made a telephone call to his house, and uh, he came out immediately to meet with uh, our undercover agent because the truth is, if you're the guilty party and if you did sell secrets and all of a sudden after 20 years of no contact with the KGB, you get a telephone call from a a Russian-sounding person saying, I want to talk to you about what we've done in the past and see what we can do in the future, uh, you better find out who that is. So Lipka came out and met our undercover agent. We had uh, two or three meetings over a period of six months, three, I think three personal meetings. And Lipka was very cagey, but he did give us uh, bits and pieces of information. He admitted that everything he did, he did for money. It was pure greed. He told us some of his drop sites where he placed the documents in Washington. He told us that his wife helped Uh, She would flash the lights or or honk the horn of the car if somebody came while he was out putting his documents down. And that was a great thing because that action of her helping him in an espionage activity took away the spousal privilege so she would be able to testify against him in court. So we conducted that background, that, that undercover operation with Lipka until the end of December of 19. 93 and at that point we how many times how many times uh did the undercover agent meet with him he met uh personally with him personally four times they had some written correspondence with each other but uh, we had made a mistake in part of the undercover operation i mean lipka was very cagey and he knew something was wrong he knew 
I think he was confused. He knew something, things weren't fitting properly, but uh, he couldn't figure it out, fortunately for us. So when that undercover operation ended, the next step we planned was to go to look his ex-wife. We didn't want to, I wish sometimes in hindsight, you know, it might have been better to go to her first. But we didn't know about the relationship. We were afraid she might call him and tip him off. So we, we went with Lipka first, knowing that anywhere along the investigation, should he find out about our investigation, we would already have as much from him as we hoped to get. Uh, we interviewed his ex-wife, a very lengthy interview for five, five or six hours before she finally put her head down and, and said that her husband had been selling documents to the Russians. And it was a great confession. It was painstaking after that to try to draw pieces of information from her. She didn't know a whole lot. Uh, she was an abused wife by him, and uh, they had had a child together, uh, divorced in 1975. She was, uh, and she promised him she would never say anything. But she said when the FBI came to the hospital where she was working in Maryland, that she knew immediately what the, what the, what the interview was about. And, uh, so that was a big piece of it. Uh, big part of the case to get her cooperation. So when you approached her, um, you said you, she was working in a hospital in Maryland. Uh, she no longer feared Lipka. Um, sh she really had more fear about uh, the FBI approaching her, it sounds like. Oh, she was, she was absolutely scared to death. In fact, when uh, Dan Brennan had made the contact with her and said, he, he actually told her that we wanted to talk to her about her husband's former coin business. When they divorced in Lancaster, he owned a coin shop. We had no other guys to use, so Dan just said that. But later she would tell us that she knew as soon as he said FBI, she knew what it was about, that it was about Lipka and his espionage. Fortunately, we were able to get a confession from her, uh, as, as much as she knew. She had been to some places. She had seen some of the uh, his handlers. Uh, she had seen him wrap documents but she wasn't familiar with the documents. Uh, she knew that, uh, she actually told us one time when she had the baby, she would pace the floor of her apartment holding the baby when he would go out to put documents down, worried whether he would ever come back or not. So it was pretty, uh, pretty intense for her. And I think she was uh, uh, very upset about it. And uh, we did grant her immunity from prosecution so that she would try, hopefully be more forthcoming with us. Uh, so she wouldn't have testified against him in court, which was good. So that was a long... And was she aware of the money, too? Oh, she was aware of the money. She said he would come home with the money. They'd sit on the sofa together, and they'd throw it up in the air. She said it was just like James Bond. So, I mean, she was enjoying it. They bought uh, Ethan Allen furniture with it. They had to be, she said we had to be careful not to, not to spend too much. And yet, you know, she knew his KGB code name. Uh, that was one of the things that we didn't know when we first met with Lipka. But she knew it. Uh, his code name was, was, his code word for the KGB was Rook, and she told us that. So she was pretty tuned in to the, to the whole thing. Uh, although she, now, when, you were first, when you were first talking about her and you said she was an abused you know, wife, I felt a little sorry for her and thought that she was an, an, an innocent participant, but I guess you wouldn't describe her um, that way. Well, she, she was. I think uh, we're not really sure what he told her. Uh, we think that he may have just told her he was doing this for for his boss at NSA and that he was able to keep this, the money with his dealings with the Soviets. And perhaps she, she at one point asked us, well, it wasn't like he walked into the embassy or anything. And I said, yes, he did. That's exactly what he did. He walked into the embassy and volunteered to be a spy. And she put her head down and cried. She had she seemed to be genuinely surprised that that's what he did. So I kind of think he he covered up what he was really doing, uh, making it sound like. And he had an alibi. Uh, he told it to our undercover agent. He told it to his wife. He said everything he did, he did for this guy named Milt Roby at NSA. But he also said that I saw in an obituary that Milt Roby was dead. And when you're dead as a stone, you can't testify against somebody. So he, okay. he told us the alibi that he was going to use. So I think he may have used that same thing with her. To some extent, okay. she definitely was abused. She was sexually abused. She was physically and mentally abused by him in their marriage. And that's why she left him in 1975. Uh, he actually one time uh, made a phone call to her after she was going to divorce and take their daughter. It was a, he was crying on the phone. He was pleading with her to come back. She said she wouldn't do it. She wouldn't do it. 
and she hears a gunshot and the phone fall to the floor. She thought he killed himself. She got physically sick. 20 minutes later, he calls back on the phone laughing hysterically. Well, that's the kind of person this guy was. Real sick. Yeah, guy, very, you know? very manipulative. Exactly. Um, so where are we in the investigation now? You, so we have the not a couple of times, and you said he he might be a little skeptical, a little suspicious. Yeah, it was suspicious. Something we didn't do right, and then we had her test. You know, we had her information. Uh, we went to NSA, and NSA did a great job of identifying employees who were still at NSA when Robert Lipka had worked there in 1965 to 1967. We interviewed those people. A few of them remembered him. Most of them weren't of much help. And the reason we did that was because, you know, we had this knowledge that Lipka may have been paid up to $150,000, which was a lot more than uh, Matrokin told us about. And looking at the uh, John Walker case, when he was in the Navy, after Walker got out of the Navy, he actually recruited his brother, his son, and a best friend to continue to collect information when they were in the Navy and pass it to him. And he continued his relationship with the Soviets for another 17 years. So we were concerned at some point maybe Lifka had done the same thing, that maybe he had a Confederate at, at NSA that was helping him out. But we were unable to identify that and don't think that ultimately happened after we did the interviews. So after we, after we talked to the NSA people, uh, the last thing that we had to do was really um, was try to get Matrokin himself uh, to testify against Lipkin as to what he knew about the case. And that was uh, pretty difficult. He was over overseas under the control of the MI6. Initially, he didn't want to help us, but uh, he came back to the United States, and we put him through moot court uh, in the courtroom, showed him how he would have to testify. And at some point, point he finally agreed that, uh, that he would do that. So we had kind of wrapped the case up as best we could, and we had one last push. We had uh, Lipka's wife agreed to meet with him. We wanted to have her meet with him and talk about what he did. And she made a phone call to Robert Lipka. She hadn't talked to him in 20-some years and told him that the FBI was going to interview her and she needed to know what to do. And he, uh, he obviously took that news very badly and went and met her, as we hoped, uh, talked a little bit. He would, She would mention espionage and he would tell her to be quiet, that she didn't really know that, and uh, he gave her $100 for a lawyer, which I thought was kind of a little chintzy. Uh, <laughs> $100. $100, okay. that's the kind of guy he is. He actually showed her pictures of his two sons from his second marriage. Never once did he ask about their daughter that they had together oh. in their first marriage. I mean, he's just, he's a total sociopath, total narcissist type guy, um, couldn't care less, but he didn't harm her. We had a lot of agents in the vicinity of their little meeting. The next day, we went out and interviewed him at his house for about four or five hours. And uh, I kind of thought he was maybe getting close. He did tell us that he was putting things out for a guy named Milt Roby. And that's the first, you know, I thought, man, we're going to get somewhere. If he can only talk to me about what he put out for Milt Roby, maybe we can flip this guy. And that he got a phone call, and it was a lawyer. This lawyer, real estate lawyer, and he said, I've got two FBI agents here accusing me of being a spy. And, of course, the lawyer, you could be a, you could be a $100 an hour lawyer. You tell him to stop talking, which he did. Right. We mm -hmm. stopped talking. We left. And uh, the next day we had a warrant, a complaint, and he was ultimately indicted by the grand jury. But we went out and arrested him the next day. And don't you know, uh, as we're putting the handcuffs on him, he says to me, just before we handcuffed him, he said, have you talked to Milt, Milt Roby? And this was his his, his uh, alibi. And I said, Bob, I said, Milt Roby is dead. And he does this big reaction, he crosses his arms over his chest and looks up in the air and says, oh, no, there goes my only witness. Nah. And I thought, you know, you just played into what you said you were going to do to the undercover guy and to your wife. So it kind of would have played great in court. But uh, I, I said... <laughs> You know, I couldn't take any more of this Milt Roby stuff. I'd heard so much of it in the undercover investigation. So we arrested him, and that was in February of 1996. He, uh, in May of 1997, he uh, pled guilty. Uh, we worked out a plea agreement where he would get uh, 18 years and have to pay restitution for the $10,000 our undercover agent paid him and a $10,000 fine for espionage. He was sentenced to 18 years. And, and fine up to twenty twenty thousand dollars. Wow! So the eighteen years is 
I mean, that's pretty significant plea because uh, can't you get the death penalty or a life sentence for espionage? Well, he had to be sentenced under the sentencing guidelines uh, for the federal court from the time he did the espionage, which would have been from 1965 to 1967. At that time, the penalty for espionage was a life sentence. And when we considered going for a life sentence, the other part of that sentencing guideline said if someone is sentenced to life, they have to serve 10 years. And after 10 years, they're eligible for parole. Doesn't mean they'll get parole, but they're eligible after 10 years. Oh, so that's a different federal guideline than, than it is what, today. What we have current, yeah. So what? So what the prosecutor Barbara Cohan and, and the Philadelphia Division, uh, Philadelphia U.S. Attorney's Office did, they look. Uh, we offered it 20 years because 20 years he would have to do a third of that sentence. The mandatory sentence was a third for any any years other than life. Mandatory was a third of the sentence, and after one third served, you would be eligible for parole and you would be released after two thirds of your sentence, assuming you didn't try to escape or you know, beat anybody up in jail or anything like that. So we, ultimately, his lawyer worked it down to 18 years, and we accepted the plea agreement uh, for 18 years, knowing that he would have to do six years, he might do up to 12 years, which would be the same thing as a life sentence under the old guidelines. So it really, and, and the reason that we did it was to number one, protect Matrokin who was still a top secret, considered a top secret recruitment in place by the British. They didn't want him to testify. We had a lot of older agents who had worked a similar case in New York City. Actually, there were two KGB illegals that lived in Upper Darby, Pennsylvania, named Peter and Ingeborg Fisher. And those KGB illegals serviced Robert Lipka. Well, the KGB illegals one time went to New York City to get instructions about contacting Lipka. And we did a big surveillance, and a lot of FBI agents were involved. And those guys were all going to testify uh, about the illegals as part of this case. But their memories, and these guys were 85 years old, God bless them, they, they were all willing to come down and testify. But they would have had difficulty on the stand with a defense attorney, I think. So all in all, the decision to probably take the plea agreement was a, was a better one. Okay. So, so, you know, after Lipka actually uh, was convicted, uh, he, you know, he made a big uh, plea in court. And this, this is this, this strange thing about this man. He said, um, he pled with the judge. He said, you know, Abraham Lincoln, he goes to the Civil War thing. Abraham Lincoln freed all the Confederate soldiers after the Civil War. And look at all the atrocities they committed. You should free me because this was a long time ago. But here's the thing. After we signed the plea agreement, we went to him with an offer. And we told him, if you will be up front with us and with his lawyer present, if you will tell us everything about the time from, the, from you deciding when you wanted to walk into the Russian embassy and sell documents, tell us who your handler was, tell us where your drop sites were, tell us what you passed, what kind of damage you caused to the national security. If you will tell us everything about the case for those two years and then pass a polygraph that you told us the truth, we will significantly reduce your sentence. So here he is. He's given the offer right. to save himself, to get out of jail free almost. And uh, we, we met with him, the prosecutors, and a couple FBI agents, NSA, we all met to debrief him. He agreed to do it, and he, would, he just played the stupid card. I don't remember anything. It's a long time ago. He wouldn't tell us anything. He would make up stories. He belittled everything he did. He said, I didn't have 50 meets. I only had 12. Uh, I only passed uh, eight documents, and, and I was only paid $1,500 and $50. And I can tell you about the 50. I mean, he would just say strange stuff. His attorney stood up and pled with him, said, Bob, these people are here to help you. Cooperate with these people, and you'll, you won't have to maybe even go to jail. That's all he had to do. By the time we finished the debriefings, he was given a polygraph, and uh, according to the polygrapher, when it was all done, he bombed it worse than anyone he's ever seen. So, I mean, here's a guy, Why? and that's the big question, and I talk about... So, it may be, it may be worse well, that, than you what know, you thought. Everyone, Jerry, every one of the, the, the most recent and most heinous spies that we've had, John Walker, Ronald Pelton, Aldrich Ames... Bob Hansen, the FBI agent that was arrested for espionage back in 2001. Every one of these guys 
cooperated for a reduction in sentence or for a spouse. Walker co- cooperated so that his son and his his brother wouldn't get long sentences. Hanson cooperated so that his wife would get part of her pension. Ames cooperated so that his wife would get a short sentence and, and some, some pension money. They all cooperated, every one of them. As far as I know, Robert Lipka is the only guy who has never cooperated. And so, so why? Why? And, and the only thing, there's a couple of things I can think of, and there are two. One is whatever he passed, whatever he gave the, the Russians, was so devastating, either to military lives um, or to the, somehow to the security interests of the United States, that he, he could never face that and would have to take the, he would rather take the, the years in jail than to admit that, that maybe people were killed or that comp, something was compromised so bad that uh, we could never, he could never live with it. Either that or, and this is where it gets a little crazy, but I think he was such a sociopath and such a strange man that it's very possible that he would not let me win. If he thought telling that all those answers would, would make me look good or make me win, he wouldn't let me, wouldn't let that happen. And, and to be honest with you, I don't know which of those two choices I believe, um, because he is that different. Uh, the title of my book comes from a chess move uh, that he actually told me about. One day we were having lunch together during a debriefing session and I told him that I you know played some chess I knew he was a chess player and I said I, I just just to make conversation I said I played in a real chess tournament I said I just have trouble with my openings so he told me I'll give you an opening that works the best opening you could ever use and he gives me this opening to use in the chess game well I've played chess since I was seven years old and the opening he gave me is called fool's mate which is the title of a book and fool's mate is the quickest mate in the game of chess, it's a two-move checkmate for the person that, that opens. So here he's telling me a move that's going to get me beat in two moves in a, in a chess tournament. I mean, that's the kind of mentality this guy had. I didn't confront him with it. I thought, all right, I'm going to let him think he's beat me, and I'm going to go out and use this move and get beat for the next you know, 20 chess tournaments I'm in. But I didn't want to give him the, the joy. I didn't know what to do. I just I couldn't believe he said it. And again, that's just some insight into his personality. Um, his wife, you know, I... I one time she went home. She would work the 4 to 12 shift at the hospital uh, so that he could go to college during the day at Millersville. And one night she came home and went upstairs after midnight and tucked the baby in, went to bed, into the bathroom, was real quiet, got ready for bed, goes into the bedroom. He's not there. He wasn't in the house. He'd left the baby. Oh, uh, my God. I don't know if he left the baby five minutes before she got home or two hours before she got home. But I mean, or how many times he did that? And how many times he did this is unbelievable. You know, so this is the kind of guy he was. He, he beat her for jiggling the keys in the door when he was trying to. She was trying. He's trying to take a nap. Uh, he was just really uh, a mess. And yet we didn't. So where is he now? Where is he now? Well, he is uh, scattered to the four winds. He uh, he actually died while I was trying to find a publisher for my book. He died in uh, July fifth of two thousand thirteen. He had been out of jail since. I think he got out in 2006, in December of 2006. He moved to Meadville, Pennsylvania, and was living with a, a friend. And then he, uh, I don't know what happened to him, but I just saw an obituary that he, he died and was cremated on uh, at July 5th of 2013. So, But, uh, you know, the hardest part of that case was, was sitting behind his house the morning of the arrest and waiting for his last uh, son to to leave the house and go to school. You know, we saw him leave and cut through the backyard with a school bag. And I, I just sat there, I have my own kids, and, and I just thought how much this, this, how much their lives are going to change, you know. But how old were the I mean, kids? Maybe uh, 11 and 13, 10 and 12, something mm-hmm. like that. And, uh, you know, here he, here he walked off to school happy as a clam, and uh, he was going to come home and find out his father had been arrested as a spy. And it's, you know, they're the people that are always the victims. It's always the victims that get hurt the worst. And, you know, he could have done, it would have been so easy for Robert Lipka to cooperate. And, and I'm telling you, he wouldn't, he might have gotten time served. You know, a 30-year-old espionage case wasn't something somebody really wanted to prosecute, although the, 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 the damage done was certainly worthy of the prosecution. But uh, he could have shortened that sentence, and he just right. wouldn't do it. And that's uh, a mystery that's still 
still exist in the case, to be honest with you. I'm, I'm still hoping that someday another KGB officer will leave the Soviet Union and, and tell us, uh, you know, what was passed. Not that it matters at this point, but just uh, out of curiosity. Well, one observation I want to make is, you're, you know, you're talking about uh, investigating him 30 years after uh, he had made, you know, the drops. Um, so obviously there's no statute of limitation for espionage. That's correct. There is none. So that was something we had. And I, I was concerned when we started the case that the, the Department of Justice would even authorize prosecution of something that old. But we met with the uh, head of the internal security section of the espionage unit, John Dion. And I'd worked with John in the past when I was at FBI headquarters. And while John wouldn't authorize prosecution, it was early in the investigation. He did say that uh, the length of time that had transpired from 1965 until you know, 1993 or 4 would not have any bearing on his prosecuting decision. So, and that was all I wanted to hear because I didn't want, you know, it was a massive investigation. We had support people. Uh, we had uh, surveillance people from around the country, NSA people. We had uh, just a host of people involved, our tech squad in Philly. Uh, everybody was involved. There were so many people involved in the case. And to do all that work and to pull all that effort in to, to think you wouldn't be able to even get a prosecution would be kind of fruitless. But when John promised that he would, the, the time of the case wouldn't have any bearing, that was, it was all we needed to hear. Well, I think it's an important case as a deterrent for, for future people who may be thinking about selling secrets to, you know, our enemies, um, to know that, you know, even after 30 years, you know, we prosecute. So somebody today, somebody listening possibly even to this interview, knows that the United States takes espionage and spying very seriously. You know, and it's, it's the only crime that's enumerated in the United States Constitution. The only crime that's talked about in the whole Constitution is treason, which is espionage at the time of war. Uh, that's the only crime. And it was that serious to the Founding Fathers, and it's, uh, it's proof of a, a case this old. This is the longest-running espionage case, 32 years, ever brought before the U.S. courts. And like you say, it's, it's just a message for anybody out there that might contemplate this, that... Uh, there is no statute of limitations, and it's taken very seriously, and we will come after you. Well, on that note, John, I want to thank you for talking with us today about this case, Fool's Mate, A True Story of Espionage at the National Security Agency by John Whiteside is your book. I'm going to have a link to that uh, in the show notes uh, for the podcast, and I have a copy of it. I've read the book was aware of the case because uh, for the FBI's 100th anniversary, it was one of the Philadelphia cases that we highlighted. But it's fascinating, um, even with it being, you know, a case, uh, a crime that occurred in the 1960s, it's definitely, you know, something that is very uh, current, um, you know, as we talk about domestic terrorism, our lone wolf um, terrorists who um, are trying to contact um, you know, our enemies overseas, it's it's very current and very pertinent for, for the time now. Well, thanks, Jerry. I mean, I, my, I you know, I've just been blessed to have a career in the FBI, and uh, this was really uh, a capstone of my career to work this case. Although I, I do have to admit that uh, I think overall the things I did in Mississippi in the long run had more of a, a lasting impact on more people in the country. But uh, I've just been proud of everywhere I worked in the Bureau and, and just honored to have served the country in this way. And that's the end of the interview. You know, during the interview, John said something that I forgot to follow up on. He said that when they were talking to Lipka, that they had made a mistake. They did something wrong that made him suspicious. So I called John back and I asked him what that was. He told me that during... One of the meetings with Dimitri, the undercover agent, Lipka had shown him a name and said, do you know who that is? And Dimitri said no. Well, it turns out it was the name of the current Soviet defense minister, who would have been Dimitri's boss. John couldn't believe that Lipka continued to deal with Dimitri after that mistake, but he did mainly because they knew his code name, Rook. I want to let you know that John gave me lots of photos of his time in the Bureau. 
and they're all posted at jerrywilliams.com along with links to his narrative nonfiction about his career. Now, let's talk about crime fiction. A couple of weeks ago, I was at independent bookstore Head House Books in Philadelphia looking for good crime fiction to read, and I came across this 2012 John Gresham novel, The Partner. And what a coincidence. I'm reading it this week. At the same time, I'm editing and interviewing John Whiteside, and I realized the book takes place in Mississippi, and several times in the book they mention the Mississippi State Penitentiary, Parchman. That's the same penitentiary that John was talking about. The book is excellent. It's about a young lawyer and a Mississippi law firm who steals $90 million and flees to Brazil. After several years, he's caught and dragged back to the United States. So the book is all about the legal procedures of what they're going to do with this lawyer and what they're going to do about the money that he stole. Where is it? There's lots of twists and turns and, of course, a surprising ending. So if you haven't read John Grisham's The Partner, you might want to pick it up. This episode of FBI Retired Case File Review was sponsored by FBIRetired.com, the only online directory made available to the general public featuring retired FBI agents and analysts interested in showcasing their skills to secure business opportunities. Thank you for listening today, and I hope you come back soon to FBI Retired Case File Review with Jerry Williams. Thank you. Thank you.